Everybody, the ones that are here in the hall, and everybody that is uh, listening online. Uh, my name is uh, Meline Håkensson. I'm a media manager at Amnesty International Denmark, and I'll try to take you through this really, really interesting conference on the situation for Syrian refugees. While a humanitarian and human rights crisis unfolds in Ukraine these days, where Russia is bombing, civilians and creating a huge number of people to fly, we must not forget what Russia also did in Syria. Helping Assad to win the civil war, bombed civilians and forced millions to flee. That was back in 2011. Today, more than six million refugees have fled Syria. More than five million are now living under harsh conditions in neighboring countries. 1.5 million refugees remain displaced in Lebanon, accounting for nearly a quarter of Lebanon's total population, which makes it the highest proportion of refugees, uh, of refugees anywhere in the world. There are more than 3 million uh, Syrian refugees in Turkey. And in Denmark, in small Denmark, we have only 31,000 Syrian refugees. And the focus of this uh, conference is that we want to examine how uh, Denmark's withdrawal of protection affects Syrian refugees in Denmark, but also abroad. So first, I'd like to welcome everybody here at the panel and also online. First, we'll hear from Haya Atasi from Syrian Association for Citizens' Dignity, and you are the media manager. Maybe if you can make a short introduction of what your organization does. I'm manager at the Syrian Association for Citizens' Dignity, SACD. And I am a displaced Syrian myself. The association is a grassroots popular movement established to promote, protect, and secure the rights of Syrian refugees and internally displaced people, whatever they are. We at SACD are against any form of forced or premature return of refugees and IDPs, given that nowhere in Syria is safe at this point in time. And it has been that way since the early stages of, of the conflict, especially in areas under the control of the Assad regime. We know this based on the continuous work over the last three years of, on gathering information inside Syria and among the displaced, Information we presented in multiple in-depth reports on security and living conditions in Syria, which included views and perceptions of people living in Syria as well as in displacement. There are no indications on the ground that things are going in the right direction, and this is why the association works on several fronts to prevent policies or change in narrative that would lead to a forced return of displaced Syrians or a normalization of the current situation. Ever since the first indication that the government of Denmark may pass a, deci a decision to withdraw protection from Syrian refugees, SACD has worked to engage with Danish authorities and other relevant institutions to prevent what has become a dangerous precedent, which may endanger countless Syrians who sought refuge in third countries from the repression and deadly persecution they faced and are still facing in Syria, especially in regime-controlled areas. Minister of Immigration and Integration Matthias Tesfaye, in his correspondence with SACD, has failed to adequately justify their decision to withdraw protection of Syrian refugees or answer some of the key questions on the policy which has placed Denmark among the countries that are exerting pressure on Syrian refugees to return to what is an unsafe and potentially deadly situation in Assad-held areas of Syria. Instead, he directed all responsibility for their policy to the Danish Immigration Service and Refugee Appeals Board. On the other hand, the country of origin reports and the subsequent assessment used by the Refugee Appeals Board clearly failed to document and relay the real threat facing refugees if they were to return. They failed to illustrate the ongoing insecurity and systematic repression endured by individuals in these areas now. The assessment included deep contradictions between the information it contains and the final conclusions it makes. A decrease in military service does not mean an improvement in the security situation for returnees if they are supposed to return into the hands of a repressive regime. Prior to this conference, 
SACD was in touch with the experts who were interviewed for the Danish Immigration Service Report in Damascus, and they all indicated that the decision to remove temporary protection from Syrian refugees from these areas did not at all reflect the information they provided. Most of them will refuse to collaborate with DIS in the future or will do so under strict conditions to prevent the misuse of their interviews. It is well documented that the situation in Damascus and Damascus countryside, as well as the rest of Syria, is absolutely not safe for refugees to return without being exposed to the risk of arbitrary arrest, torture, and inhumane treatment, and any extradition to transfer Syrian refugees to Damascus or any other part of Syria, particularly areas under the Syrian regime, would constitute a breach of Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. To illustrate this point, allow me to quote several paragraphs only from the January and February reports from the Syrian Network for Human Rights on arbitrary arrest and enforced disappearances in Damascus and its suburbs, which are seen as safe to return by, the, by Denmark's authorities. I'm quoting. We recorded random incidents of arrest of citizens in Damascus suburbs governorate, with most occurring during campaigns of mass raids and arrests, which we believe were based on malicious security reports issued due to the, tar due to the targeted individual's opposition to the Syrian regime. In addition, we documented arrests carried out by the regime's security services of civilians who had previously been released from regime detention centers, with these arrests being carried out with the aim of materially extorting the families of detainees. We also documented arrests targeting a number of returning civilians, all refugees and IDPs, after they returned to their original areas, now back under the control of Syrian regime forces. On Tuesday, January 4, 2022, personnel from the Syrian regime's political security force carried out a campaign of raids and arrests in Qatsaya city in Damascus suburbs, and the arrest of seven civilians was documented. On Thursday, January 13, 2022, personnel from the Syrian regime's military security force carried out a campaign of raids and arrests in Khan Shin town west of Damascus suburbs. And there was docu the documentation of the arrest of six civilians who were taken to regime detention centers in al Kiswa city. On Friday, January 14, Syrian regime forces personnel carried out a campaign of raids and arrests in the neighborhoods of al Shamiya and Al-Wadi and al Hama town, west of Damascus suburbs governorate. SNHR documented the arrest of three civilians who were taken to one of the regime's detention centers in Damascus city. On Wednesday, February 23, 2022, Personnel from the Syrian regime's military security force carried out a campaign of raids and arrests in Qatsaya city in Damascus suburbs governorate where SNHR documented the arrest of five civilians. In February 2022, SNHR documented at least 203 cases of arbitrary arrests, including 13 children and 11 women at the hands of the parties to the conflict and the controlling forces in Syria, the largest number of arbitrary arrests was carried out by the Syrian regime forces and governorates of Damascus suburbs, Dar'a and Damascus. This is the reality in Damascus and its suburbs today as we speak. This is the, re the rest of Syria is the same, if not much worse. And this reality has been greatly shaped by an actor whose crimes we are all witnessing these days in Ukraine. There are about 6.6 .6 million ref Syrian refugees who fled the country while 6.2 million are displaced within Syria. The scale of displacement has skyrocketed ever since the Russian intervention in Syria in 2015 and its war on the Syrian people. Russia did not only actively participate in killing and displacing Syrians, destroying their cities and depriving them of means of life, but also is currently spending enormous efforts to normalize the Syrian regime and reap the fruits of its intervention in Syria. Since 2018, Russia has been actively lobbying to convince European countries and the EU to adopt two main game-changing policies. Send, Syrians, send Syrian refugees back to Syria without any change in the security situation and start financing reconstruction in Syria before any legitimate, sustainable and comprehensive political solution in Syria. While Russia is pressuring the West to send Syrian refugees back to Syria, it failed to create a single safe area in Syria despite having full control over large areas. The reconciliation agreements that were pitched and sponsored by Russia as a model for return have failed catastrophically. In areas like Dara and Eastern Ghouta and Damascus countryside, such agreements only led to further displacement, lack of security and safety, and serve as a proof to the regimes and Russia's empty promises.
The atrocities currently witnessed in Ukraine are only a fraction of what Russia has done in Syria. Imagine asking Ukrainian refugees to go back to an occupied part of Ukraine in the near future. And imagine hosting countries telling them that Ukraine under Russian occupation is safe. This is what Syrians are being asked to do. Russia's interest in Syria, Russia's interest in claiming that Syria is safe lies in entrenching its military gains into permanent control of the country. Russia keeps hosting conferences on refugee return in Damascus, the last one in July 2021. Denmark cannot afford the damage to its image of a democratic country to be the only European state whose policy on return of Syrian refugees in fact aligns with that of Russia. Any policy that pushes Syrian refugees into an unsafe and immature return essentially serves Russia's interests. Sending Syrians back to the current Syria will only contribute to further violence, instability, and an increase in displacement rates, as more than 67% of people who were forced to return to date have stated that they will attempt to leave again at first opportunately, at this time permanently. Denmark and other European countries hosting Syrian refugees must be well aware of the implications of such policies of premature return, which not only threaten the lives of Syrians, but also will have ramifications that will rever reverberate on the region and Europe as well, and will threaten any hope of peace and stability. The irresponsible policy to strip Syrian refugees from protection and put them in a situation that forces them to return acts as a dangerous precedent to refugee hosting countries like Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, and potentially other European countries. We believe that it is unacceptable for a country like Denmark to try to solve the refugee issue based on internal politics and inaccurate assessments, resulting in policies that violate human rights are in direct violation of EU regulations and interests and align with Russia's interests, rather than advocating as an active European member for an EU position to promote for a truly safe environment in Syria with a comprehensive political solution to ensure a safe, voluntary, and dignified return for refugees. We stress that neither the Syrian regime nor Russia can be guarantors of any peace or security in Syria. This, must, this fact must be well accepted. The main drivers of displacement cannot be part of any safe environment in Syria. The international community, especially refugee hosting countries, must work towards achieving a comprehensive political solution under a safe environment in Syria that guarantees the safe, dignified and voluntary return of Syrians. And to use available diplomatic and economic leverage to do that. The situation in Ukraine showed us that such leverage exists and can be used when there is a political will. If the world would have listened to Syrians years ago, if the world would have taken Russia's crimes against humanity and war crimes committed in Syria seriously, maybe we could have prevented the disaster situation we have today in Ukraine. Let's not repeat the same mistake again. Let's not cave into what Russia and other oppressive regimes want. Europe cannot appease murderous Russian and Syrian regimes. Denmark's policies cannot serve Russia's agenda in Syria and cannot be the cause of more suffering to Syrians. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, my question concerns the crimes you're describing and the uh, possibility to bring justice to those uh, suffering from them. What are your thoughts on how you're calling for the international community to, to uh, make a comprehensive solution? If justice is to be part of it, how do you see uh, international jurisdiction uh, playing out here in, uh, in, in bringing justice? Well, first and foremost, uh, like I mentioned in my statement, there should be a political will. As long as we are seeing countries which are going towards normalization with the Syrian regime, as long as we are seeing countries which are working towards uh, uh, forcing the Syrian refugees to return, it means there is no political will to actually punish the perpetrators of crimes uh, in Syria. And um, a main and essential pillar of, of, of having a safe environment in Syria is for the international community to have a political will to punish these people and to bring them to justice. We have seen some trials in Germany uh, I think these are promising trials. Uh, um, the, the European countries must act and the international community must act with a political will 
to bring these uh, perpetrators of crimes to justice, and I think it's possible if there is a political will. Thank you. I just have a short question. Mm -hmm. um, your organization has done a lot of research, a lot of interviews with Syrians in Syria, uh, and you've done a report called uh, Normalization of Horror. Yeah. Uh, can you just see what are the, 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 like the main points in, in, in that report? So the report included uh, interviews with uh, Syrians living in Assad-held areas. Some of them are Syrians who never left. Some of them are returnees who left and then were forced to go back. And some of them are Syrians who live in reconciliation areas, which I mentioned in my statement. Uh, we did this report because we wanted to, to, to explain the reality of, of the, the economic and the security and the living conditions of people who live in uh, areas under the, uh, the Assad regime. Uh, I don't recall the numbers, I don't want to make mistakes in, in stating out percentages, but uh, what was really striking in the report is that uh, uh, the, the lack of trust in the regime, the, the, its inability to provide security, the level of, 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 of detentions and arrests that are happening, like you just said, it became part of their life. Uh, uh, every single man in Syria is afraid to go out to the streets because there could be a checkpoint which could take him to the army for forced conscription. It's, it's too unsafe to the extent that uh, uh, people that people are being scared that you any of your loved ones could be forcibly detained and then you could be extorted for money. These are means which are being used in Syria. It's not only about being shelled uh, uh, with a barrel bomb. It's not about uh, having military operations. The lack, the, the extent to which there is lack of security and lack of life means in Syria, especially in areas under Assad control and in areas under uh, which have have went under reconciliation agreements is striking. And this is why we wanted to publish such a report to explain that this is the reality of Syria uh, under Assad and this is what Syria will look like if Assad remains. Because the Assad regime, alongside its allies, Russia and Iran, are the main drivers of displacement in Syria. And unless we resolve the main problem and the main cause of displacement, we cannot have any future peace and stability in the country. I encourage everyone to, to read the report and to read the key findings. You will be surprised at how bad the situation is in these areas. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now let's welcome uh, Nadine Keshin, who are with us uh, from Beirut in uh, Lebanon, and you are with us online. You represent uh, Aleph Lebanon and uh, Refugee Protection Watch. Can you start with a short introduction of the two organizations that you are representing? Of course, thanks, Malin. Okay. So basically, I'm participating in the conference wearing two hats. First of all, representing my work as a project coordinator on refugee rights and protection in Lebanon with ALIF, a Lebanese human rights organization, and also representing Refugee Protection Watch, of which ALIF is a member. So Refugee Protection Watch combines local Lebanese and Syrian, as well as European uh, NGOs that are all looking towards global solutions for uh, protection issues affecting Syrian refugees. Can you hear me well? Yeah, it's very well. Okay, great. So uh, in that light, I would be talking a bit about the shrinking protection space in Lebanon, the situation of refugees in Lebanon, and how this is sometimes uh, not helped by policies in Europe. So we're seeing, if anyone has been following uh, Lebanon's news, we're experiencing several uh, crises, uh, one on top of the other. Uh, we have a severe economic collapse, which we are only at the beginning of. So things are expected to continue deteriorating uh, as time goes on. This was exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the Beirut explosion, of which we are still trying to recover. We're still rebuilding. Meanwhile, we're, as uh, Malin mentioned, we're hosting 1.5 million refugees, uh, the largest number of refugees uh, per capita in the world. Uh, so the deteriorating situation is, of course, very much affecting refugees and other vulnerable uh, groups in Lebanon. The rates of school enrollment for refugees has gone way down. So we're looking at potentially a lost generation of, of uh, you know, youths who will grow up with no job prospects, no future prospects, because they are unable to get education. Uh, child labor is up, 
and there's been increased reports of GBV crimes and employment exploitation. Um, these are protection issues that I always work on as uh, in, in my position at ELIF. However, I've had to shift some of my focus to looking at irregular migration, which has risen, and forced deportations because we believe that this is a big risk coming up, uh, especially with the Lebanese elections coming up in May. So the declining situation in Lebanon has, of course, resulted in increased uh, social tensions, tensions between uh, refugees and host communities. Um, and we expect that this will, this sort of scapegoating of refugees, uh, blame shifting will only worsen with the upcoming elections. Meanwhile, Lebanon has not ratified the refugee convention and has a very narrow, uh, has very narrow protection laws for refugees. Mm -hmm. Um, so looking at that and seeing that legal residency rates is at an all-time low, 16% only of refugees are legally registered in Lebanon. So we can see that this poses a huge risk for potential deportations then. Um, and this is something that along with uh, some of our colleagues and other organizations, we try to monitor and intervene on in case a refugees are detained and potentially being processed for deportation. But this is made more difficult when the protect protection space is shrinking and where, the, where there's more issues that we need to cover in our advocacy. This is also made more difficult when uh, countries that are more stable than Lebanon and have better human rights protections are also kind of violating the right to seek asylum and uh, removing protected status of refugees. So with that, I would like to shift to talk about some of the things we cover more with RPW, uh, Refugee Protection Watch, where we're, we've been focusing a lot on uh, advocating for more burden sharing, responsibility sharing with regards to the Syrian refugee crisis. Um, we're very concerned at RPW with the growing anti-refugee sentiment that we've seen in some European countries and the policies and practices that are denying rights to asylum seekers. A part of our work um, with European stakeholders is to ask for support in our pressure on the Lebanese government to respect the principle of non-refoulement and to respect the right to seek asylum. Um, this is made. Th this argument is contradicted when uh, Denmark declared Damascus safe for return, uh, when the, uh, protected status was removed from some refugees. And when we've seen these violent pushbacks of asylum seekers at several European borders. Uh, we've also been very disappointed with the very low rates of uh, resettlement over the past couple of years. Only about 10,000 uh, Syrian refugees have been resettled since 2020. So that's about 1% of the Syrian asylum population in Lebanon. So that's really dismal. <laughs> um, so of course, this lack of responsibility sharing goes against the spirit of the Refugee Convention to which Denmark and many other European countries are a party. Um, the Refugee Convention highlights the need for international cooperation around refugee crises so that the burden doesn't fall too heavy on certain countries. In other words, it envisioned a situation where a potential conflict could result in a large influx of refugees, which could in turn destabilize uh, neighboring refugee hosting countries. So to avoid this, the convention calls for international cooperation and burden sharing. But unfortunately, we have not seen this cooperation to the extent uh, necessary to maintain stability in Lebanon. So this uh, shrinking protection space in the region and the lack of prospects for a dignified uh, return to Syria or a dignified future in another country has led to a rise in irregular migration as well as to premature returns to Syria. So RPW has done research on, on return, returnees to Syria and has found that actually many people who returned ended up re-returning to Lebanon or leaving again to go to another country because what they found upon returning to Syria was that the situation was not what they expected. And this is largely due to a lack of a monitoring mechanism that's able to monitor returns to Syria and judge whether such returns are actually safe or not and what is happening to returnees uh, when they go back. So we've been pushing for um, a return monitoring mechanism so that information can also be transparently shared with uh, refugees in other countries, uh, Syrian refugees that are uh, residing in other countries, so that if they are to return, they actually know what the security situation is and they know if they or their loved ones are at risk if they return. 
Um, this a refugee monitoring mechanism has been implemented in many countries, such as South Sudan, uh, Afghanistan, Venezuela, and usually this is done by UNHCR. But unfortunately, UNHCR is not is not willing or potentially able to do so in Syria due to the delicate situation. However, that doesn't mean that a monitoring mechanism cannot be put in place. Uh, in our Refugee Protection Watch paper on a monitoring mechanism, we've advocated for um, sort of a coalition, uh, a joint monitoring mechanism, which would include both uh, potentially UN bodies or larger INGOs, along with local CSOs and NGOs that are potentially more able to relay accurate information from within the country. So these are the main points that I wanted to highlight, and I would like to finish just by issuing a broad call to European stakeholders to declare, first of all, that Syria is not safe for return to support the call for an independent multi-stakeholder mechanism with a mandate to monitor conditions for a safe, voluntary and dignified return to Syria, uh, an increased responsibility sharing for the Syrian refugee crisis, which would include uh, increased resettlement rates, creating safe pathways to asylum uh, and an opportunity for temporary visas and residencies, and most importantly, respecting the right to seek asylum and the principle of non-refoulement. Thank you. Uh, I just have a question uh, for you, Nadine. I'm just wondering, how has the authorities, the Lebanese authorities, um, reacted to to the Danish uh, policies towards uh, Syrian refugees? I mean, have they been vocal about it, or have you like sensed that now uh, there's more open space to actually force uh, refugees to go back? Because now, uh, yeah, a rich country in uh, in Northern Europe says that it's safe in Damascus. Uh, we haven't. I haven't seen them speak specifically to the Danish decision. However, um, already they had attended had attended the previous uh, conference on Damascus uh, that was previously mentioned mm -hmm. on returns, and there was already um, a policy in place. Uh, as many people know, we've had many shifting uh, government representatives over the last couple of years with the situation in the country. However, there was already a, propo a proposal in 2020, I believe, uh, for a returns policy. Uh, this was not eventually taken up in Parliament, but we expect that with the upcoming elections and the tensions between refugee and host communities in Lebanon, that this will be a big uh, sort of platform point for many of the factions that are in power. And we expect this issue to be brought back onto the table. So that's why we really are asking uh, our European allies and decision makers to set the example for Lebanon about how refugee rights should be respected rather than creating contradictions in terms of maybe supporting protection spaces for refugees in Lebanon, but not actually doing the same uh, in their own countries. Thank you. Yeah. And then uh, it's you, Nadia Hartmann from Human Rights Watch. You are a human rights uh, researcher and you're the author of uh, a report that came out last October on returnees to Syria. Yeah. Welcome. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Nadia. I work for Human Rights Watch in the Refugee and Migrant Rights Division. Um, I'm going to repeat probably a lot of what Haya and Nadine have already said, um, but maybe that will add more evidence. Um, so yeah, I, I was living in Beirut up until uh, December of, of last year, and we focused on uh, what happened to Syrian refugees who returned from Lebanon and Jordan. I mean, one of the reasons why we focused on um, Lebanon and Jordan is because I was living there. In, in Lebanon, and I thought I could travel to, to Jordan as well, but uh, the pandemic stopped that. Um, but, you know, our findings are applicable everywhere. A lot of the questions I get asked is, you know, is there a difference between Syrian refugees that return from the, the Middle East, from the region, and those from Europe? And there is not. You know, refugees, the diaspora outside Syria, the treatment is, you know, is... <laughs> it's not going to fall into a different category because people return from, from Europe. Um, so the findings of our report of what happened to people who returned from Lebanon and Jordan is applicable also uh, to, to decision makers and policy makers here. Um, I just wanted to say that at the outset. Um, so one of the reasons why we, we decided to do this report is because I, I used to be the head of protection 
uh, for Syrian refugees in Lebanon, um, for a, a humanitarian organization. And, you know, as, as Nadine was saying, Lebanon is a really difficult place for Syrian refugees. And in the last, I'd say, three to five years, it's really mm. clamped down on uh, making it a hostile place for, for Syrian refugees to stay and wanting them to go back. Um, and one of the things that we were constantly advocating with diplomats and with others was, you know, you can't do this because it's reforma. It's, it's against the international obligation to send people back to a place where they will face harm. But what we couldn't do is draw on specific examples of what happened to people, right? It's really, really difficult to get that information, to track what happens to people when they return. Um, because people inside Syria are, are under surveillance, are uh, extremely scared and rightly paranoid in terms of telling people outside, you know, the reality of the security situation. And that just is, you know, we know anecdotally, but getting that kind of hard case evidence is difficult. Um, but we, we decided to do the same, and, and, and our colleagues at Amnesty also, um, around a similar time, published a similar report. And we talked to 65 Syrian refugees or their family members because, Unfortunately, some of the, the, the cases involve people who, who died. Um, but 65 cases um, of Syrian refugees that returned from Lebanon and Jordan, the countries that have the highest per capita population of refugees in the world, and that means Syrian refugees in both contexts. Um, we looked at why people returned. It's important to po point out for our research, you know, I wouldn't call them voluntary returns in the context of Lebanon. You know, when you don't have legal residency, when you're not allowed to move, when you live in housing that is inadequate beyond any standard, and, you know, you're constantly faced with harassment, you know, the threat of detention and deportation, which is provided for now in Lebanese law, um, it's not a, a voluntary return, right? But we would call those coerce, it's a coercive environment in Lebanon. So, but everyone we spoke to still made the decision to return. And in Jordan, the, the context is somewhat different. Um, it's, it's definitely not, a, it's not coercive like Lebanon, but there are other pressures. So we asked people why they decided to leave. Um, and invariably, people said because they wanted to try and, and see what the situation was like back in Syria, to, to reclaim their lands, um, to see if they could build a life back home which is completely understandable and is underpinned by the international law obligation uh, to, to, you know, or right to return. Um, people said they couldn't access medical care in Lebanon and Jordan. You know, there, it's provided for, but not for chronic conditions. You know, not if you have cancer, uh, not if you need long-term care. That's not going to be subsidized by UNHCR or the state of Lebanon and Jordan. Um, and ultimately, you know, People didn't have the information. Like, this might seem shocking because you think, you know, there are networks where your family and friends will tell you what the reality is like. But repeatedly people told me after, and this is one of our main findings, that the misinformation is a big factor that, uh, you know, pushed them to return. In the sense they didn't have the information they needed uh, to really make an accurate, informed decision about going back. Um, and that's because you don't have monitoring mechanisms, you know, because it is impossible. Denmark does not monitor what happens to people who do take uh, the money and decide to return after they've lost temporary protection. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's, that's the, the context. But another thing just to quickly also cover, you know, you get humanitarian organizations doing things called intention surveys. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. It's basically interviewing refugees about what they want to do. Right? And they do them on like a quarterly basis. UNHCR produces intention surveys, which is humanitarian spiel for like, what do people want to do? Do they intend to go back? And repeatedly over the last decade, and it's still the case, Syrian refugees continuously say they don't want to go back because of the safety and security environment in Syria. And that is most important. What do Syrian refugees want themselves? They do not want to go back. Um, okay, so that's just the, the context. Um, so I'm, I'm going to throw some numbers now. 
So the, just briefly, the findings of our research, out of 65 um, interviews with, with Syrian refugees and or their family members, we found the following human rights violations in case of persecution. 21 cases of arbitrary arrest and detention, 13 cases of torture, three ki kidnappings, five extrajudicial killings, 17 cases of enforced disappearance, and uh, one case of alleged sexual violence. Um, I mean, enforced disappearance, uh, you know, and again, it's just a, an international law term to, to mean that, you know, the, the, the person disappeared and no one would tell them where that individual is. No, like, it's the state completely denies. It's the most heinous of crimes because you just simply have no idea and no one will tell you either verify or, or deny or, or confirm that your loved one is, is, is in detention. You know, and the people I spoke to in these cases, it's just, you know, they're just desperate because they have no information. Um, so one thing before I go maybe into a few case studies of, of you know, like, the stories themselves, everyone I spoke to did their due diligence. Because they made this decision to go back, they were, this is so annoying, um, they were aware that they had to check their names on security lists. They had to enter into reconciliation agreements. Um, and I should also say, everyone I went back, everyone I spoke to went back to government controlled areas or reconciled areas, as, as Hayat pointed out. So they, they, they did the things that they were meant to do. You know, they, they checked their names. Um, it's a huge process. It's a process you generally have to go through. You cannot go back without getting your name security cleared. And most of them, you know, who did this got security clearances. I mean, no one I spoke to didn't. You know, everyone was approved to go back. Um, I spoke to, to one man, uh, a 34-year-old man from, from Hama, uh, sorry, from Homs, uh, who was living in the, the Beka Valley, which is uh, an area where about a third of the refugee population lives in Lebanon. And he and his family made the decision to go back because they were quite wealthy and they had you know, land in Syria. Um, and they did security clearances for, for their whole family. And they came back cleared. Um, they were told, you know, you're safe to go back. On the second day that he, you know, him and his family returned to Homs, he was picked up by the political intelligence agency, um, was brutally tortured by that agency in detention, and then handed around, which is another pattern and practice of what happens in detention in Syria, handed over to another intelligence agency to go through the same kind of brutal human rights abuses, I mean, torture, um, just, you know, awful humiliation, um, until his mother could basically bribe her son's uh, release. Um, and what he kept on saying to me when I, when I met him and interviewed him is, you know, he thought he was safe. Um, he'd gotten the, the security clearance and still this, you know, this happened to him. He was forced to sign documents in detention that he, you know, was not given the time to read, understand. The only thing that he saw was the name of uh, a neighbor who had denounced him. Um, I mean, and this is the point, you know, the randomness of the targeting you know, this indiscriminate way of uh, deciding that someone is perceived to be affiliated with the opposition is just widespread. You cannot, people ask me continuously, what is a profile of someone that could be targeted on return? There is no profile. There is, there simply is not, uh, no profile. This happens to men, women, and, ch and kids, unfortunately. I spoke to an 84-year-old man um, who was hung from a ceiling in detention. Uh, you know, and, and I mean, yeah, the, the case speaks for itself. Just horrifying. Why was he detained? He doesn't know. Um, I mean, uh, you know, you have these exemptions in, in Syria that, you know, a lot of, um, I hear a lot about, you know, there are amnesty laws for, for, for military conscription. Um, you know, there are exemptions. Maybe, you know, it'll be a, a, an environment where people can go back and they won't expect to be arrested by the army. I want to give you a case of one man who uh, was of military age, but he is an amputee because he'd lost his uh, leg in the war before he fled to Jordan. And when he returned, he was told by the military office in his hometown that he was exempted. Um, for military service because he has one leg. But he was told to go to Damascus to get an official certificate. So he went to Damascus 
and he was stopped at a checkpoint. It was a military security checkpoint. And they humiliated him. They insulted him. They said, why aren't you, why haven't you been, why haven't you gone to the army? And he showed the document. They ripped up the document. And then they took him to a detention center and he was also tortured um, until randomly six months later, he was released in the middle of a market in Damascus and managed to make his way home. Um, so most of the, the relatives of the people, this category of people I said were disappeared, tried to get information by paying people. The, the cases of, white, of, of bribery and extortion that we documented are numerous. There is a practice now of paying senior officials to try to get information about loved ones. Sometimes that information comes back, sometimes that information is correct, invariably it is not. Um, but people are, will do anything, of course, and especially in an environment where the, you know, the Syrian pound has massively depreciated, there's high you know, uh, inflation, it is an extremely expensive practice, but I spoke to people who are just selling off everything they can to try to get information from loved ones. Um, and then finally, you know, one of, I guess, the, the major, another major finding is even when people who returned didn't experience a human rights abuse or case of persecution, they struggled to survive. Um, the, the economic circumstance and situation in Syria is devastating. People return back to homes that are, were either partially or totally destroyed, looted, you know, like, like everything gone, like wires, windows. Um, and they were forced sometimes to pay the bills for houses they hadn't lived in for the last eight years. Uh, they stood in, in lines for bread for, you know, for hours on end. They tried to get the one bus per week, uh, you know, to access a, another area. But again, terrified of crossing checkpoints. Um, but our call is also to uh, not prematurely force returns just because of the humanitarian situation, because people cannot live uh, a life of dignity right now inside Syria, and that needs to be recognized, as well as the, the fact that uh, the safety and security environment is, is just simply not there. Um, I mean, we had like many recommendations, um, and yeah, maybe we can send you a link to the report, uh, to the Syrian government, uh, to the Lebanese government, to the Jordanian government, to any uh, refugee host country, so Denmark as well. Um, and it's basically that it is, it is not safe to return to all parts of Syria um, and to not force returns at this time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia, for this horrible and horrific insight to what the situation is actually like back in Syria. Are there any clarifying questions? No. Then I'd like to introduce uh, Lisa Blinkenberg. Uh, she's senior advisor for Amnesty International in Denmark and uh, has been working a lot lately on Syrian refugees, especially since Amnesty International also published uh, a milestone report about Syrian uh, refugees returning back to, to Syria. And Lisa has mainly focused also on how to persuade or how to stop the withdrawal of uh, protection statuses of uh, Syrian refugees here in Denmark. Please. Thank you. <coughs> yes, uh, I would like to present our report. You're going to your deaths about uh, violations in Syria. It's from September 2021. And um, our research period was one year from July uh, 2020 till June uh, 2021. Uh, we did interviews with 41 individuals covering 66 cases uh, and within that there were th uh, 13 children, 15 women and uh, 38 men. Uh, the returned uh, refugees came from Lebanon, uh, 39 cases, but also from the Rukban uh, informal settlements which is between uh, Syria and Jordan. And then we also had uh, seen some returnees from France, Turkey, Jer Jordan, Germany, and the United Arab uh, Emirates. We also uh, talked with uh, human rights researchers, humanitarian workers, and experts on Syria and refugee rights. 
So uh, these cases of Syrian refugees were uh, Syrian refugees who returned to Syria between uh, the middle of uh, 2017 and spring 2021, and these were all subjected to gross human rights violations. Uh, one third of the violations, they took place in Damascus and the region, and these are areas that uh, the Danish government is con considering to be safe. And all these violations were committed by the Syrian government and the security forces. So what are the human rights violations? I mean, we have heard a lot about them, and, and unfortunately, it's more or less the same. I mean, uh, we saw uh, 59 cases of arbitrary detention. So Syrian who were arrested without any arrest warrant or based on any uh, legality, and some of them were detained up to 15 months without any access to a lawyer or judge. Uh, the Syrian regime dehumanized these people and calling them by numbers and not their names. And these were either uh, interrogated about their relatives or they were detained because they had fled um, abroad. And this was sufficient to raise suspicions or, as you told Nadia, uh, also to get some bribes. Um, we documented uh, 33 cases of torture and ill-treatment, even some of them died in prison, and Amnesty International has documented uh, severe uh, torture and ill-treatment in the uh, Syrian prisons for years. Uh, there was a, a very uh, um, comprehensive report from 2016 from Satnyaya prison. We also documented 27 cases of enforced disappearances and the destination, the destination of 17 Syrians is still unknown. Uh, among them are three children or four children from France at the age of, I think, four, six, two years old and 16 years old. We also saw 14 cases of uh, sexual violence and rape, which was used as a tool of torture and to humiliate and punish and, and control these uh, people. So why did they return? As you said, there is a gross uh, kind of misinformation about the situation in Syria. And these people did not think uh, they were not uh, involved in any opposition groups or related activities. And uh, they thought it would be okay to, to return to Syria. And we even saw um, some women and girls returning uh, firstly to see how the situation was. But many are also uh, targeted because they sought asylum abroad. And they are considered terrorists by the Syrian government and the security forces. And I will quote here um, some, some, some uh, quotes from the security uh, officer at, the, at a border crossing saying, why did you leave Syria? Because you don't like Bashar al-Assad and you don't like Syria. You are a terrorist. Syria is not a hotel that you can leave and return to when you want. And another one, you escaped when the country needed its people. We also documented these 14 cases of rape and uh, sexual harassment. Even uh, a 13-year-old boy and a 5-year-old girl uh, were raped. And we have the story of a, a, a girl, a woman, uh, called, which, uh, who we are calling Yasmin. She was raped by the security member the day she returned from Lebanon. And the official said, this is to welcome you to your country. If you get out of Syria again, we will welcome you even better. We want to humiliate you and your son. You will not forget humiliation in all your life. And she, Jasmine, was raped in front of her children. So what are our main points on Syria? And I've left some reports over there. You can read afterwards. Um, and that is the arbitrary and, like you said, the indiscriminate um, attack on, on Syrians and that no one can be safe in Syria and that women and girls are as much at risk as men and that many uh, of the returnees are considered as uh, terrorists. So no part of Syria is safe and all that could flee again uh, away from Syria, they actually did it. 
And like you also said, there's no monitoring system, there's no UN agency, the International Committee of the Red Cross or NGOs, they are not uh, there. So based on our uh, analysis of the situation on the ground, Amnesty points out that any forced return to Syria would be a violation of the international obligation of non refoulement so what is Denmark is do, uh, doing? I mean, uh, you, you are going to tell us more about that. And Denmark does not have any forced returns right now, but they are laying a strong pressure on Syrians to return. And we have seen letters from uh, the Minister of Refugees and Immigration, Matthias Tesfaye, saying that it would be best for all parties if rejected Syrians return to their home country. And at the same time, it's kind of a paradox, Denmark is saying that Denmark, the Danish government, will refrain from actions that will be interpreted as normalization of the relation with the Syrian regime. So since December 2019, Denmark has considered Damascus and the region to be safe, and uh, we have seen hundreds of Syrians who have had their protection status uh, revoked. Uh, Michaela will talk more about that. And there was a, a, a report from the Danish Immigration Service as back in 2019, which was highly criticized. There has been uh, other reports, uh, one from October to, uh, 2021, and we did criticize that as well. There's a letter in English if you want to see over there. Uh, so it is uh, also a kind of paradox because we have a low figure of uh, on, and numbers of Syrian refugees in Denmark and even though um, uh, they need to go back and now we see the whole situation with Ukrainians in Denmark and they are, have, will have access to all kinds of rights and it's really creating fear among Syrians and they can risk remaining in, in Danish return centers um, for, for years. Uh, without being able to access the health system or education or work. So our main calls are that uh, all Syrians in Denmark should still be protected and have a dignified protection where they have access to all kinds of rights and that um, the Danish government should not lay any pressure on Syrians to return. So that's all for me. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> And then uh, our last uh, speaker is uh, Michaela Klente Bendixen. She's uh, founder and director of Refugees Welcome, which is a humanitarian organization based on uh, volunteer work. They are doing massive work for refugees and refugees' rights here in Denmark, and she knows everything <laughs> about <laughs> figures and numbers and this horrible asylum system that we have in, in Denmark. So the floor is yours. And uh, the, the, the question that you just raised is also something that you will uh, talk about. Yeah. Thank you. And we're very proud to co-organize this event with the SACD. Uh, and we're grateful to have these very busy experts with us uh, in Copenhagen. My topic today is the Danish angle. Uh, why is Denmark the only country to revoke Syrian refugees' permits? And what is in fact happening with the Syrian cases here? Experts and journalists have proved how the reports from Danish Immigration Service about the security situation in Syria are biased and how uh, the sources do not agree with the conclusions. This is not the first time the Danish Immigration Service is accused of manipulating reports. It happened in 2014 with the country report on Eritrea, which was so flawed and misleading that it was in practice dismissed. Three journalists won the highest Danish award for unraveling the truth about that report. Again, something similar happened with the report on Somalia from 2017, and it led to hundreds of Somali refugees losing their permits in Denmark, but sadly enough with much less uh, public attention than the Syrians. Danish Immigration Service is not an independent, neutral body. It falls directly under the Minister of Immigration and Integration, which has led an increasingly hostile uh, policy on refugees for the last 20 years during changing governments. Denmark has taken a leading role in Europe, trying to make the country as unattractive for asylum seekers as possible, and it's working. We are now receiving the lowest numbers since we started counting 40 years ago. The present government has announced a goal of zero asylum seekers in Denmark, 
presenting a plan to move all asylum case processing to some African country that might accept to do it for the right price. But this story goes back to 2015, when the number of Syrian refugees arriving in Europe rose very suddenly and caused a panic uh, reaction. The government decided to introduce a new status, Article 7.3 in the Danish legislation, for war refugees without a personal story of persecution, similar to the kind of refugees we see coming from Ukraine now. But compared to other kinds of refugees, these ones had limited rights to family unification and the permit could be revoked even if slight security improvements occurred in the home country. And this is the main reason for the conference today. In 2016, another important thing happened in Danish asylum law. The Refugee Appeals Board has always been a very strange construction in the Danish legal system. The board has the final word in an asylum case without access to the courts or even the ombudsman. Now the government decided to cut down the five members of the board to only three, arguing that the member appointed by Danish Refugee Council was incompetent, representing the asylum seekers indirectly. Since then, the three members of the board have been a judge, a lawyer appointed by the Danish Lawyers Association, and an employee from the Ministry of Immigration and Integration. In other words, the three decision makers are two neutral persons and one directly working for the minister who has a goal of zero refugees. This construction is not acceptable in a rule of law perspective. However, when Immigration Service started revoking Syrian permits, two-thirds of the decisions were overturned by the Refugee Appeals Board and were granted individual asylum status. This happened in spite of the structural political influence and in spite of the board still referring to Immigration Service's misleading reports, simply based on personal information which came out when the person was represented by a lawyer. So far, out of the 600 who initially, lo initially lost their uh, permits, only 100 have lost them finally. And many of those cases have been reopened afterwards, or people have left by themselves. At this moment, there is not a single Syrian in the Danish deportation camps. Denmark has no diplomatic relations with the Assad regime, so forced deportations may never be possible. It's not a coincidence that Denmark is the only country to withdraw protection for Syrians. It's a consequence of a policy designed to scare refugees away. But the 31,000 Syrian refugees in Denmark are all sleeping badly now, even if only a few percent of them are actually at risk of losing their permits. Another thing which created the present situation is the fact that all Syrians are still here on temporary permits, up for extension every two years. And attachment to Denmark is not really considered until you reach a stay of 10 years. Syrians who happen to end up in one of our neighbor countries in 2015 all have permanent stay or even citizenship by now. Let me finish by giving you a typical example of these Syrian cases in Denmark, one which has even been described in international media. Faiza came to Denmark with her father in 2014, when she was only a teenager. Her father's case was hastily decided back then. He never filled out the asylum form, and the summary of this interview was never translated to him as the procedure would normally dictate. It never came out that he had been imprisoned and tortured in Syria because he was never asked about it. But he still got the individual convention status due to military service. Faisa, however, only got the general protection status. And coming from Damascus, Immigration Service revoked her permit to stay in Denmark last year. But because her story came out in several media, where she criticized the Assad regime for their brutal conducts, she was granted asylum by the appeals board for bringing herself at personal risk by speaking out in public. The same thing happened to several others. She can now finish her education as a nurse, and she can be sure to find a job, as there is an urgent need for trained employees within the health sector in Denmark. This story illustrates several aspects of the Danish policy. Decisions based on inaccurate information, splitting up families who have been through hell together, dragging people through long, stressful procedures for nothing, and even throwing away the resources of refugees who have already become part of our society. Thank you for listening.
Thank you. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, I would like to hear what are uh, your main calls to the Danish government? Uh, well, um, I think it's obvious that, of course, the, the, the reports which these uh, revokings are based on are faulty and they should not have been... The, the conclusions in the reports are, are wrong mainly. So nobody should ever have, have had their residence permit revoked in the first place. And now the, the uh, practice of the appeals board also shows that people actually have individual reasons on top uh, if you look uh, deeply into the cases. So I think it's obvious that, that f and also after these other very, very uh, thorough reports came out, there is no argument for revoking a permit from Syria, for, for, from anybody in, uh, from Syria at the moment, and pr probably not for a very long time. And I think the present situation of Ukrainians show that, that even the, the, the rules that we had before that are used against the, the Syrians now to revoke them, they were not even strong enough to protect the Ukrainians. Because if they applied, that's my judgment, if they applied during the normal uh, asylum procedure today, they would be rejected. They would end up in the deportation camps, all of them. So the protection system in Denmark is simply too weak. It's always been too weak. We need to have a broader... Uh, definition of protection. We need to protect people also for humanitarian reasons, not only because they are an individual uh, danger for something they have done personally. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the situation of the uh, uh, Ukrainians actually illustrates how crazy the, the policy against the Syrians have been all along. Now they're trying to make things better, but they're doing it as a special law to, to make special rules for only the re Ukrainians. They're not considering to change the general rules, which have been so, so wrong for such a long time. So I really hope that this will be the first step of some changes, but I doubt it. And Lisa? Yes, we agree in, in, in uh, <laughs> saying that, that Syrians should still have protection in, in, uh, in Denmark until the situation in Syria has stabilized and Assad has been brought to justice and we have seen this. Yeah. But, but I know, uh, Elita and Nadia, I mean, you've been touring the Danish authorities with these uh, massive reports telling the truth about the horrible security situation in Syria. How did the authorities receive that truth? and all that evidence that you did. They thanked us for <laughs> our hard work. That's what they said. Um, I mean, they received the reports, and, and I mean, literally, that's what they said. They thanked us. Um, but, you know, it, it, I mean, it's clear to me that there, there's no willingness to revisit the, the decision on Damascus and Damascus countryside. Um, I think really important now is to watch what happens to other areas inside Syria. Uh, I am sure that the Danish Immigration Service is looking at other areas to designate uh, safe. And, you know, what we can do is put pressure to, to, to stop that. Um, you know, Human Rights Watch was one of the organizations that was interviewed by the Country of Information Office. Um, it's a difficult question whether we would do that again. You know, I mean, of course, as, an, as a human rights organization that documents, you know, and fact finds like Amnesty, we want to put you know, and, and all the, you know, the, the NGOs that appear on this panel have this information. But do we want to be complicit in another designation? You know, what, do we want to have to issue another letter saying, you know, this is not what uh, our interviews, um, you know, demonstrated? Uh, I think it's really important to, to really put pressure and to raise awareness that other areas are being considered right now. Um, but I, I really don't think that Damascus and Damascus countryside is, is, is going to, to be redesignated, um, although that is obviously our call. Mm -hmm. But then it's also, well, interesting now, we're not inside the politicians' heads, but it's also interesting what you're saying, that there are no uh, Syrian refugees right now at any of these return centers. So why is that? Has the pressure actually worked? No. It hasn't. It's not because of the pressure. It's because of the, the system, the, the not very good, strong legal system, but still the legal system. Mm -hmm. um, they, and, and the focus was mainly on, on scaring people away, of sending a, an image, of sending a, a message and, and, and creating a, an image of Denmark as a very tough country for refugees. 
but it's not working in the end because the security system uh, situation is simply too bad, mm -hmm. no matter how you put it. Mm. And uh, you, Haya, what would you like to say um, to the other Danish than government? Other than agreeing with, uh, with everyone, I would like to assert that we cannot compartmentalize safety in Syria. We cannot say, uh, we cannot do an assessment for an area over the other. All of Syria is not safe. There is no safe area environment in Syria. And this is why we cannot start any conversation about sending Syrians back to any area in Syria. This is something very important if we are going to send a message to the Danish government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you, Nadine? Yes, um, I totally agree with everything uh, my colleagues on the panel have stated. Uh, in terms of, of you know, revoking uh, protected status, I mean, the thing is, where there's a will, there's a way. Like, what we've been seeing at Alif is uh, we're doing some research on the rise in irregular migration. And what's shocking is that even new new migration routes are are being thought of, new methods of of migrating irregularly. Most recently, we saw with uh, the cases at the Belarus-Poland border. But there are, there are more uh, pathways coming up because if there is a need to flee, people will find a way and they will put themselves at risk um, in hopes for a better future. So, you know, why create a humanitarian crisis? Why put people's lives at risk at borders? Why not just cooperate internationally and address the situation as it really is on the ground and, and find durable solutions for, for uh, this whole crisis. Thank you. Can I make an um, addition? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, just, I wanted to say that the association issued a report, We Are Syria, where uh, we interviewed 1,100 Syrian refugees and IDPs, and we asked them about their conditions for return and what do they want to see for return, and what does a safe Syria mean to them. And it's very important when we are talking about Syrians going back is to actually talk to them and to ask them, what do you want to see in Syria? What must happen in Syria for you guys to feel safe to go back? So including the displaced Syrians in these conversations is something extremely important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a question here, and there's a question there and there. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, first of all, allow me to uh, thank you very much, all the people who are involved in this. Uh, it, I work with Haya uh, for the Syrian Association for Citizens' Dignity, and this is a huge thing to know that uh, we are not alone. Uh, I think this is very important uh, in terms of solidarity, because I think that uh, therein also may lie an answer to what do we do, mm. especially in the new circumstances around Ukraine, uh, just simply uh, strengthening the solidarity and working together, I think, may be a, 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 a strong uh, factor in, in what we are able to do. But let me ask you questions that people are asking. So we have a question, and this is for the uh, two uh, colleagues from uh, Denmark. Could you discuss the process a refugee has to go through from the stage of a residence permit being revoked until the final decision of the Refugee Appeals Board? Just to put the human cost of this policy into people's minds. What does it look like in terms of people's lives being separated, destroyed, uh, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, really. Um, what happens is the first step, you, you get a letter from Immigration Service in your digital mailbox saying that we are considering to revoke your permits. That makes people extremely nervous, obviously. And then they get a date for interview long time in the future, like way ahead of them. Uh, so they have a long time to, to stay at home and be nervous, but nothing really happens. Then they go to interview with the immigration service, like when they arrived here in the same place, the same situation. And these interviews are more like interrogations. Mm. I've been present at many of them, and it, it is like going to a police interrogation, even if they try to, to make it in a nice way. But the questions are very, very suspicious and very hostile and very detailed. Um, and... 
then they have to, to answer s about their own situation, about their personal uh, motive for asylum and why they would fear to go, to go back, uh, about family members, uh, political activities, etc. Um, and then uh, immigration service takes a decision, uh, usually a few weeks or maybe months after, um, deciding whether to revoke the permit or to, uh, or to keep it or change it into another status. And um, many of these cases have actually been changed already in that instance. So they, they put people into these second interview rounds, but they changed the status to something stronger or something better. Um, so you could say there was no real need for that, but they, was, they were treating like almost 2,000 cases in this way, uh, where most of them actually never lost their permit. And then, if you lose it, you are appointed a lawyer for free by the Danish state who will represent you to the uh, Refugee Appeals Board. That takes also a long time because there's a waiting time, obviously, for the uh, Refugee Appeals Board. And then in that waiting time, you have meetings with your lawyer who can uh, try to, to present your case in the best way and try to find uh, more documentation about your personal issues. And that's where a lot of these personal angles actually appear for the first time because uh, many people have not really gotten the chance to explain uh, everything or not being asked the, the relevant questions during the interviews. So some of these personal, uh, very important ang angles appears for the first time during the, the interview with the, with the lawyer. And then the lawyer can, re can present that for the Refugee Appeals Board, and they will, in many cases, actually two-thirds of the cases, agree that there is a personal motive. This person is actually in danger and not just running away from the war in general. So, in a way, the, the whole uh, procedure illustrates how the procedure is weak in itself, because the end of the, of the decisions, they prove that the first decision might actually be flawed, or at least inaccurate, or not considering everything in the case. Um, and if they end up having that final decision by the Refugee Appeals Board, they lose their rights to stay in Denmark, and they have to stay in uh, one of the deportation camps. They lose the right to work, to study, uh, to get any kind of benefits. They just have three meals a day. It's like an open prison, literally. Um, but then, again, many of these cases are getting reopened by the, the, the stubborn lawyers. We have one of them here today. Um, so even that is not the last step in many of these cases, they get actually reopened and things happen be when people present themselves in the media uh, or participate in, in different things. So in the end, very, very few people end up losing their permits finally. Of course, some will do at some point, but then they usually go to other countries and ask for asylum or family unification or whatever, or they just disappear. Some of them, we don't really know what, what happened to them. A few more questions? Can I yeah, just, sure. Yeah, and the last time I checked, like one month ago, uh, we saw 40 Syrians at these return centers. But as you, as you m mentioned... They're not there. They're not they're there. They're not there, maybe, no. but that was a figure we, we received. Yeah. But, but then, as you said, many of them have uh, fl 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 uh, fled to other European countries. And yeah. Uh, the next question... Uh, is about the role of UNHCR and it is both in Denmark what is UNHCR doing in Denmark to address the policy if anything but also uh, maybe for Haya and Nadia more about the generally role of UNHCR in informing refugees about the conditions in Syria uh, because the point of uh, them not being informed about the reality was raised. So perhaps maybe first Denmark and then more generally. Do you want to ask? Do you, uh, I, I don't know whether there is a representative here from UNHCR, but um, yeah, I mean, it's difficult to, to talk about the, the assessment of, of what they are doing here in Denmark. I mean, I've, I've, I've met them at, at, at meetings and so on, but I, I, I don't want to <laughs> describe what they are doing. Um, but what are they doing yeah. in, they have in Syria? Been, they and have what been are they, writing they have letters been to writing, the Danish. They yeah. have, addressing, yeah. have been addressing the, the Danish government directly mm -hmm. and, and uh, really insisted on uh, keeping up the protection of all Syrians. Mm -hmm. And also 
they have been recommending Denmark to to dismiss these uh, limitations of this seven uh, three status to to align it with the other kinds of statuses. In their views, they have they have pointed to, out to the Danish government many times that a refugee is a refugee. Everybody needs a stable and durable solution, and we should give uh, people five years of stay instead of two years or one year, uh, and we should not consider. Um, revoking permits at such a, a, a week uh, with with these very very weak uh, arguments and, and facts that they base them on but in Syria and, and Lebanon yeah. what is their role there we have written a lot on our website uh, you guys can check it out about the misleading role of the UNHCR in promoting return and especially on their social media accounts visits by by the chief Filippo Grandi had a visit to Eastern Ghouta where he was meeting with with families who returned and uh, providing misleading information that the situation is safe for return that people can return we condemned the, the participation of, of the UNHCR in such misleading messages because we believe that sending people these signs is implying to them that it is safe for you to return at the time when it's not. So we continuously, and in, and in many of, of, the, of the articles we've written, we called upon the NHCR to first update their protection thresholds, second, provide accurate information on the actual security situation in Syria, and third and most importantly, to follow up with the people, because I think the, the, the uh, Nadia and the others mentioned here that they don't know what happens to the people after they return. It's not enough for you to talk about return and to promote return. It's very important to tell Syrians what happens to them if they return, and we believe that the UNHCR is not actually fulfilling this responsibility. And you, Nadine? I'm sure you have been working a lot with you and Atia. Sorry, it just takes a minute to unmute. Um, no, not not really. Uh, I mean, one of the issues that we have as a local NGO is is a bit is a bit the opacity around the role of UNHCR and to what extent they're able to respond to, uh, say, cases of. Uh, uh, refugees who have been detained and maybe processed for deportation. And this is uh, what we've discussed as well with, with RPW and the monitoring paper, which is that normally it is UNHCR that takes on the returns monitoring role and would inform uh, displaced persons about the situation in country. But for whatever reason, it doesn't seem that they're able to take on that role. This is why we need another solution, because as Haya said, we need to make sure that uh, refugees are indeed aware of the situation that they would be returning to and whether or not they will be safe. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, just two more. Yes, there, and then we have over here. There, there are, I, I'm very happy to see such engagement on Facebook, but uh, uh, maybe to give a chance to, to people here. So. Um, I think it's a general question to everybody. Are you also engaged in advocacy with politicians in the EU Parliament as a way to put pressure on Danish politicians? This comes from Marie Yule Petersen. In terms of our, our political advocacy, mm -hmm. are we targeting EU uh, parliamentarians and should we be? Yeah. Lisa? Uh, yeah, yes, we have, and, and Matthias Tesfaye, he, he had to present his findings and, and uh, recommendations uh, to the, uh, the session of Liebe recently at the European Parliament. Um, so, yeah, we have been, I mean, I mean, we have sections all over the world who are laying kind of pressure towards the European parliamentarians as well. Yeah. But, but there was a, a big cooperation uh, among uh, Danish uh, NGOs about this meeting where the Danish minister was going to explain himself uh, in the parliament. And there was a big co cooperation here among uh, NGOs to actually brief the, the different uh, politicians that would actually attend that meeting. And actually there were uh, quite a lot of uh, politicians from other countries that were very vocal about you know, what is going on in Denmark. Do you have something to add? Yes, I, uh, the, all the Danish uh, larger NGOs have been collaborating a lot on, on this issue for a long time. Uh, and we have been trying to, to address the, the EU and also the, the UN uh, bodies, all the, the different committees with their uh, periodic uh, review, etc. This, this topic has been mentioned every time that, that we are very, very worried about the, the Danish policy on, on revoking residence permits and also 
um, lowering the threshold of, of when you can revoke a, a, a permit in general. Yeah. And the Danish uh, Refugee Council has done a lot as well there. Yeah. One of the main yeah. NGOs organizing that event also with a lot of input. Uh, what about Human Rights Watch? Have you been working on Yes, I mean, we briefed, um, be briefed the EU member states. Um, we did uh, some briefings together with Amnesty as well on that. I mean, the... I think the e there was an EU parliamentary resolution, I can't remember exactly when last year, that stated the, the position that uh, Syria is not safe. Um, that remains the position. Most EU member states, apart from uh, Sweden, holds that position. Sweden also uh, has a similar designation for Damascus, um, but it doesn't revoke residency permits like, uh, like Denmark does. I just want to also add a point on UNHCR. It's really... Um, I mean, it's, it's important as a foundation to know that UNHCR does not um, consider Syria safe right now. It is sending mixed messages with, uh, because it has programs inside Syria um, looking at integration and voluntary returns and people that want to go back. You know, I, that's another issue. But generally, as, a, as, a, as, a, as the agency mandated to protect refugees around the world, it still is not facilitating returns. And we need to hold UNHCR you know, up to that standard. And, and if it changes, that would be you know, a, a really worrying position. But uh, as of right now, and there is no um, indication that it will change, it is not promoting and facilitating returns. But yes, it doesn't have access uh, to monitor returns inside. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have two slightly legal questions that I hope the panel will respond to. The first, maybe most to Nadia and Lisa. I mean, your your report seemed to suggest that in many, many cases, there is a real risk of refoulement uh, in, in return cases. So my question is, at least for some specific profiles, perhaps, uh, such as women and girls, my question is, uh, are Amnesty and Human Rights Watch considering or supporting strategic, strategic litigation in this area with respect to Article 3 and situation in Syria. And my second question is probably best for Mikola, but that relates to cessation standards, which you've touched on briefly. But I think a really significant legal issue here is that, of course, we're not talking about convention refugees being subject to revocation. Convention refugees require fundamental, stable and durable changes in the country of origin, whereas those with temporary protection status, of course, only require serious, fragile and unpredictable situations. So my question to all of you, but perhaps especially Mikula, is, is there any momentum for legislative change in this area to raise the bar from that very minimum protection threshold? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Want to go first? Um, it's a really good question. Um, we don't do strategic litigation um, at Human Rights Watch. We don't do cases. Um, we, uh, we hope that our report is used uh, in wherever <laughs> is relevant to support uh, positions. Um, there is a threshold definition between temporary protection and convention protection. You know, I think that's, that's the tricky thing here to, in, in Denmark. You know, Denmark isn't getting rid of refugee status um, for Syrian refugees. It's, it's revoking temporary protection. And temporary protection is uh, it's subsidiary, it's complementary, it's meant to be there in a case where someone um, doesn't have asylum protection, right? And it can be revoked and it can be removed. It's just that, you know, our position is in this, in this situation, it doesn't make sense. I mean, a question of whether, you know, that the definition could be challenged is, you know, probably for, for, for Danish colleagues. Um, but it, it, it is important to, to note in this context that people who don't, I mean, you, you know, I'm sure you well know this, people who don't, qualify anymore for temporary protection do have the right to, to get better protection as a refugee. It's just that what is the point in going through all that? You know, they're, they're, and like the whole context doesn't, um, doesn't justify the ordeal, frankly. Do you have something to add? Lisa? Yeah, and, and if you need to have your uh, residence permit revoked, then the change has to be durable and fundamental. And, and we are not saying that all will be subjected to violence if returned to Syria, but we are saying that the risk is so high 
that, uh, and, and, and there is a really high risk that they will be subject to, to torture and uh, violence and death, which is Article 3, um, and, and, and therefore they should still uh, have the protection status. Michael, do you have anything to add? Um, I think this, um, the situation of, of Syria is, is quite complex because the majority, the vast majority of refugees who came from Syria to Denmark, they got convention status. Denmark was very good at that, actually, giving a lot of people convention status without discussion. It was only a small part. It was only 4,500 out of the 31,000 who got this weak and temporary protection status. And that was at a point when uh, the bombs were, were falling, but things seemed like they would be changing. Uh, there was a hope that, that Assad would be taken over and that there would be some kind of gov government uh, installed or some kind of, of peace negotiations and somebody to, to negotiate with uh, about returnees. But then Putin came in and made things even worse. So you can say these 4,000 uh, people in Denmark who got this weak protection, they got it because of the acute uh, violent situation that would at attack anybody. And because the chaos was so massive and there was nowhere to hide and nowhere to, to survive, basically, in, in Syria. Um, and then slowly, during these cases, when, when they processed them individually uh, with the thought of revoking them because the bombs sta stopped to fall, <laughs> basically, um, then the, the picture changed because it, it came out that people actually had individual reasons for not going back because they were being returned to the dictator that they had fled from. And because of his, mis I mean, the reason why it's peaceful now, seen from outside, is because he, uh, he's in total power. So, so the situation has changed in Syria during their stay. So their situation is very different now from what it was when they came. Uh, and that's what these very uh, changing and very um, weird decisions uh, illustrate, I think. And now there's also a humanitarian situation, uh, as, as Haya described, and you know the, the basic needs of people are not accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think f this has to be addressed somehow. We have to make some kind of protection status which is which is meant for this kind of situation, because that's what we see with, with Ukraine also. People have no individual reason for, for running away from Ukraine now. Very, very few have. They just run away from the bombings and from the humanitarian catastrophe. And that should also lead to protection, of course. But the legislation doesn't really. Not until it, it rises a very, very high level, which is totally unacceptable for everybody. So I think we have to... to, to um, expand mm. the, the definition of something like 7.3, some, which is actually a, a necessary thing to have, I think, to have some kind of status for war refugees, people who don't have a, an individual motive, but are just running away from the general situation. But the level for that has to, to be lower so that it um, includes more people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think... Uh, if you just have a follow-up, and then the last question from here, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Yes. Sorry, Yuda. Just a very, very quick follow-up question. Of course, I understand Human Rights Watch and Amnesty do not bring cases, but do not intervene in specific cases as third-party interveners or amicus curiae. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, not. Not in that decision. Um, I mean, we do, but I, our division generally doesn't, um, the Refugee and Migrant Rights Division. I mean, it would, I mean, yes, we've done amicus curiae in, in, in particular cases, but not, um, yeah, we, we haven't in, in, in these contexts, no. And you have been very patient. <laughs> <laughs> agree with all of you said, so it's so, so important. It's only to follow up, uh, you were a long time ago talking about um, reports, about, and I think as a practicing, I'm a lawyer, that it's so important that we get the report quick, as quick as possible, as many as possible. It's the only way of trying to persuade, for example, the Refugee Board of Appeals. So therefore, we need it from you, like, <laughs> specifically all your front, the front organizations. So even they do skim the report, we other can study them, mm -hmm. and then we can f point out the main points. So please continue with that. So even it takes time, and nobody really read it. We read it, <laughs> and then we can, we can use it. 
And uh, the, the, the other thing, uh, and also all what Michaela said, I completely agree. So I don't uh, re repeat. But what I could like to know much about, about our minister always said, oh, it's so wonderful because 170 about that person have gone back to Syria by their own. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that maybe somebody where they have a very old parent and they are very ill or something like that. I could like, and please some of the organizations, to get a report about in which, why did they go back? Mm -hmm. So because they, uh, they did not go back because they loved it. Because maybe they mm -hmm. missed the country too much and they missed the family too much. And the second thing about intervention, uh, the uh, Danish uh, River Council, they intervened in cases and that's very good. So as much as people can intervene, it's very important. Even they don't like it, the authorities don't like them to inter intervene, but I think it's important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I just make a yeah, brief sure. comment? Uh, so, so why are people going back? Um, I mean, in the report we are describing that all the people, Syrians who could flee away from Syria, did it again. Uh, but those who, who remained in Syria, whether due to uh, parents who were ill or... or uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, and our report goes into the reasons why. Um, and actually, just on interventions, we do inter... It, it's really difficult for Human Rights Watch to decide to intervene in a case. Like, we have so many cases we could... If someone is known to us and we know the case, then we might intervene. And if we can provide a letter of support or something like that in an asylum case, we do. But we have our thresholds of when... Um, but we haven't... I haven't been involved in any, in, like, open amicus, amicus curiae on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very short and very short. Yeah. You first. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't man. Just a very quick clarification to yes, strategic mitigation. We haven't yet, but Amnesty has a history of, of assisting. So we would definitely want to lift that and, and aid in such interventions if possible, but uh, we haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there are some sections who do it a lot. I mean, the Swedish section does a lot of litigation. Um, yeah. I just, uh, uh, if I may, uh, from our work, uh, to address a point that has not been addressed, which I think needs to be introduced in the public sphere in Denmark, uh, probably as a matter of urgency. And uh, like... Uh, the colleague, the lawyer said, uh, we are working on reports and one of the reports we are working on is the scenario in which, let's keep in mind that there are more than 13 million displaced Syrians, almost now 7 million refugees, but also internally displaced, mostly in the north, uh, some 4 million uh, around Idlib. If people are forced. We are working on a scenario where only a quarter, only three million mm. out of that. And trust me, this is not implausible. We have a very uh, uh, toxic debate in Turkey right now that is facing uh, elections next year, uh, which hosts more than four million Syrians, where the opposition basically is running on the premise that it, it, if it gets into power, it will return all Syrians. Lebanon, we could hear from Nadine that the Lebanese government also had a, a proposal floated about return. Um, and and uh, Jordan is playing with some sort of uh, safe zones concept, which is unfortunately getting some traction uh, with some politicians. So. Uh, the, the point being that if we return even only 3 million by force, the studies that we have done is that more than 70% of those who have returned are looking for ways to go uh, to flee again, this time permanently, as a life or death matter. So what we will see is another huge wave of displacement. So this is the, the debate that I think needs to be had in Denmark in terms of the solutions that may appear as, uh, let me use a very wrong term, sexy in, a, in, a, in, a, in the short term, are catastrophic in the long term because they are feeding public debates in Turkey. 
They are feeding uh, discussions around uh, uh, Syrian refugees as, look, Denmark is doing it. Yes, they have a smaller number and it's a smaller, but they're doing it. It's a European democratic country. So why, why should we not be doing it? So it's a very important uh, uh, issue f to, to introduce in the public debate in Denmark. Consequences, long-term consequences of this policy. The last question, I'm sorry that I took the time, but I think it is important. Uh, it comes from Yulun Eka Jafferson, and I'm sorry for the pronunciation. What can students in Denmark and common Danes do in terms of grassroots support of these rejected refugees? What can others do while the politicians play their games? And I'll finish on that. Thank you for the very good question. Let's take a, a quick round uh, on that. Let's start in Lebanon. Nadine? If we start. Um, it's it's a bit difficult to comment on uh, you know advocacy spaces in, in other countries, but of course, like usually politicians respond to popular will. So I think making sure uh, it's obvious and clear where many people stand, or hopefully the majority of people stand, to you know to push that you want to be a country that is respecting all of these rights and that is setting the standard uh for others i think that goes a long way you know whether it's petitions or protests or or letter writing etc mm -hmm. and you higher in in what way can ordinary danes actually support the case of syrian refugees um i think it's very important that the danish uh politicians understand that the Danish people or the majority do not support these types of policies. So when it comes to advocacy, when it comes to voting, when it comes to local elections or voting out these types of, of, of political parties, this is where the Danish people's role uh, comes in. For the, for, for the politicians to feel accountable uh, to these people and that our people are against these policies. And to be honest, I mean, I personally believe that a large, a huge extent of this decision uh, by the by Denmark's government is is behind, has political motives behind, and once these politicians understand that the people who vote for us do not support these types of policies which we are adopting, then there's no point of of of, of moving forward with them. <coughs> so I, I think that's it. Yeah, no, I mean more of the same. Um, I mean I've seen some pretty impressive protests here. Um, get involved in protests. Get involved in in local activism. Um, get out on the streets, write, write to your MP, um, yeah, take action. Yeah, I agree. And, and then also to get hold of the right holders themselves, I mean, Syrians, and, and fortunately we have seen many Syrians uh, out in the media and we have had the support as well of a really extraordinary uh, guy, Mahmoud, um, a, a young guy who, and, and then his parents actually got, uh, of, of, of their residence permits were not revoked. It happened last Friday. So, so yeah, I think... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree, Haya, that I don't think the majority of the Danish population actually supports this policy. There was a, a, a survey also recently saying that actually 73%, I think it was, of the voters for the government, for the Social Democrats, they were against their own, government, the, their own government's policy uh, when it came to, to Syrians. Um, and we have seen huge protests in Denmark actually defending the Syrians. There was one day where we had 25 demonstrations in 25 different cities in Denmark on the same day in the same time just to protect the Syria with, with the headline, Syria is not safe. Uh, and many of them, as you mentioned, Lisa, many of them have been presenting their stories in the media. And I think the, the normal people who are not really interested in this subject and doesn't know how it works, they get really shock, shocked and very surprised when they hear that, they, that you can separate a family. Like, take a, a girl like uh, Faisa and uh, take her away from her father. She came to, they came together. They've been together always. How can you separate a young girl from her father and, and keep him here? It doesn't make sense. And also some of these uh, stories where the opposite was true, where uh, young people who are studying and working, they suddenly have to, to see their old parents go to deportation camps or even being sent back one day. It doesn't make sense to anybody and, and not even to to the most nationalist and defensive of, among the Danish people. 
They don't, when they see how this, these laws affect people in real life, they don't agree with it. So I think what we have to do as organizations and also the media, I think the only way is to, to illustrate that um, when it comes to refugees, it's not numbers, it's not a gray mass of people who are threatening us and changing our culture and, and uh, exploiting the country. It's individuals with the same needs and the same uh, personal stories that we have. And they're not here to, to make our lives worse. They're just fleeing for their lives and they're trying to adapt and trying to, to be part of our society. They are not the enemy. <laughs> they're just normal people. Um, I think this is, this is the, the challenge somehow to, to take out the faces of this huge gray mass that everybody's fearing. To, to present that they are not uh, a grey mass, they are individuals, they are normal persons, they are real girls, girls and boys and children and old people and whatever. Uh, and they don't come here to, to destroy Denmark, they want to be part of us actually if they are allowed to. And I think maybe the Ukrainian situation can show people something about that, even if I'm extremely uh, shocked and, and so sad to see this way how, how discriminating it is. Like suddenly we welcome this group just because they come from not so far away and they look a little bit more like us. It's, it's nauseating to see actually, uh, for me, uh, who has been fighting for, for people from like coming just a little bit longer away from um, and, and see the hostile policy they've been met with. Uh, but I think some of these people who are, have not been working with refugees and don't realize how, how hard the policy is, they are now standing up for the Ukrainians, and some of the people who write to us, they're already shocked. Like, is she supposed to live in Sandholm in the, in the reception camp? Why can't she just stay with me? Well, we have rules, you know, people have to stay in asylum camps. So maybe some people will, will open their eyes to realize how the system actually is when they, when they face it now. And on that note, uh, I think we should uh, close this really, really interesting uh, debate and discussions. And I'd like to thank you so much, all the panelists. Actually, I tried to take notes because then I want to wrap it up, but we have covered so many areas. There are so many things that we need to do, that we are doing. But I think that the, the discussions here and also your presentations shows that the solidarity and the sharing of information is uh, what we have to continue working on. So we will make the politicians listen. Activism is really needed because it's also uh, the, the public that can actually change these laws and of course work with the, the people that it is all about, the Syrian refugees, because they are really, really strong and they have also here in Denmark been very, very, very vocal, uh, which is also one of the reasons why some of them can actually stay, because they've been so vocal, very, very brave and very, very inspiring. So thank you, everybody, and thank you very much to Refugee Welcome and the Syrian Association for Citizens' Dignity for arranging this really, really cool event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.